Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through 2 Peter. And uh, today we're going to start in, well, pretty much uh, verse 5. Uh, last time we finished up in verse 4, and uh, verse 4 ends with a period. So now we can start in verse 5. It's a new sentence, but verse 5, 6, and 7 are all one sentence. And in verse 5, 6, and 7, we see seven things that Peter says we need as Christians. That he says that are good for us, and that in verse 8 will, will help us to not be barren or unfruitful. Now, I don't want to be barren. I don't want to be unfruitful. Now, later we'll see here also these are seven things that all Christians need so that we don't fall. Now, verse 10, you shall never fall if you do these things. So I don't want to fall as a Christian. I don't want to fall into sin. I don't want to depart from the way that God wants me to go as a Christian. God has a plan in the life of every Christian. And I've always thought of it like this. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But there's God's way and there's our way. And when we get saved, what we're supposed to do is read the Bible, study pray and walk in the spirit that we fulfill not the lust of the flesh. So I believe God has his plan and God's up in heaven saying now this is what I want my son or daughter to be like and there's a path that in God's mind we should go down. But often as Christians we end up sometimes messing up and we do our thing. We, we fail or we fall. Then we have to get back into the what we call it is the will of God. So, to me, the will of God is like this, okay? So, we got room here. So, here we are going, and here's God's will here, to go straight up here. And, and ultimately, by serving God, we, we'll end up doing His will and being where He should. But many Christians' lives are, they go along the will of God for a little bit, and then they kind of get off track, and then they have to come back. So, this should be a line, but it looks more like, like that. Then they go on a little ways, and they get off track, but then they come back. And then they go, and so you got a thing where many people's Christian lives look like this. <laughs> Instead of a straight line, always follow. So I want to be in God's will. And I want to be, like, the Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. I want to always be doing the work of the Lord and doing what God says. So that my Christian life looks more like a line of always staying in the perfect will of God rather than looking like, I don't know, what does that look like? I don't know much about electricity, but what does that look like to you? Like some sort of resistor or some sort of electrical thing? I want to make sure that I'm always in the will of God and that I don't fall. Thank God when we're saved and we do fall into sin, well, God has forgiven that sin already at the cross. So it's all about the cross of Calvary. Amen? And I thank God for the blood the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. So, if I do fall, the blood of Jesus forgives me. So, when I do sin, though, I should go, God, I'm sorry, and confess it to Him and tell Him, Lord, I, I wish I hadn't done that. But when I do fall, it is forgiven. Now, that's not an excuse for me to go sin. Some people look at Christianity and go, wow, grace? You're saved by grace? Well, okay, well, I'm going to do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. And then I'll go sin because, because I'm forgiven. Well, that's not the way Jesus looks at it. That's not the way God says. God doesn't say, now that you're saved, go sin. He doesn't say that. Rather, as we read Peter and we read uh, Paul and we read through the Bible, we read Jesus, we're saved to serve. So we're not saved to sin, we're saved to serve. But a lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of Christians, they, they don't read their Bibles, they don't walk in the Spirit, they don't do right, and they end up going out of the will of God. Sometimes they get back in, uh, sometimes it takes a long time to get back into the will of God. Now that doesn't mean they lose their salvation. You can't lose salvation. Salvation is called eternal life, eternal redemption, and eternal salvation in the Bible. We call it today eternal security because today in the church age when we're saved, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we can't lose salvation. But we can lose rewards and we can lose fellowship and we can lose joy. So we are going through here now in the book of 2 Peter. Now who was Peter? Peter was one of the 12 apostles and he existed during the time of Jesus' early ministries before Jesus died on the cross. 
And I've told you this before in some of our earlier uh, teachings as we go verse by verse through Peter. In the early uh, ministry of Jesus, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're always seeing Peter opening his mouth and inserting his foot, always doing or saying the wrong thing, always be the first one to step up, and usually always be the first one to do the wrong thing. And uh, you gotta, you got to love him because he had a zeal for the Lord, but not according to knowledge. Sometimes he would just do things he shouldn't and said things he shouldn't. But then when we read 1 Peter, we find out the theme of 1 Peter is suffering. God allowed Peter to go through suffering. And we see that that humbled him and made him more of a humble man. The more humble we are, the more God can use us. Pride is the issue. Humility and pride are opposites. And part of being a good, godly Christian is being humble and not being prideful. So as we get into this today, I just want to lead up all to that to tell you that 2 Peter is the last book that Peter wrote very shortly before he passed away, before he was killed for his faith in Christ. And he's giving us some great advice. And what he's going to tell us here in verse 5, 6, and 7 are seven things that we as Christians should have and should practice because that will help us to bear fruit and will help us to not be barren and will keep us from falling. Verse 10. And so... I look at Peter, and like I said before, 1 Peter, a lot about suffering, a lot of milk. 2 Peter, I've told you, has a lot more meat in it, a lot more heavy, more profound doctrines that we will get into. We haven't quite got there yet, because in 2 Peter, he starts out with a little bit of milk, then he's going to give you a whole lot of meat. So we're still in the milk part, if you will, but if you ever heed anything in the Bible... Please heed these next four verses, verse 5, 6, and 7, and, and even verse 8, because these are seven things that the Apostle Peter says to us that we that are Christians should practice, should have, should be. And if we do these things, they will help us to not get off track and get out of God's will. They will help us to continue straight doing the right thing, doing God's will. Okay, so let's start at verse 1, and then I'll read all the way down to verse 10. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. And to Peter, faith is precious. Well, faith in what? Well, Paul tells us faith in the blood. So our faith should be in what? Our faith should be in Jesus, of course, because Jesus is God, manifest in the flesh. We've looked at that before. The Trinity, or the Godhead, one God, but in three persons. And Jesus is the, the, the Son, God the Son. So faith in the blood. Because it's, faith in the blood is you're trusting the blood atonement of the Savior. You're trusting in Jesus because you're trusting in what Jesus did for you on the cross. So you're trusting the blood atonement of Christ. So he continues there, having obtained like precious faith. Faith is precious because without faith it is impossible to please him. God demands faith. And we're saved by faith today. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. With the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace. You know, we're in the time period today, the church age, a time of grace, as opposed to the time of the law. And he says there, verse 3, According as his divine power, who? Jesus. Jesus is divinity. He's divine. He is God. He's deity. Divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now, I told you not uh, well, a couple times before to look up my video on YouTube, the seven things that Peter calls are precious. It's interesting. He's about to give us seven things, but in First and Second Peter, he gives us seven things that he calls precious. I just find it so amazing how many times in the Bible there's seven this and seven that and seven this and seven that. Seven is God's number. It's a number of completion or perfection. So God gave us these great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers. He says, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. How's that? Well, we get a glorified body, just like the body of our deity, of our divinity, of Christ, our Savior and God. Uh, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's the problem. The world is full of lust. You see, we have the flesh, 
and we have the Spirit. Well, if we walk in the flesh, we're going to fall. But if we walk in the Spirit, we're going to be in God's will, doing what God wants us to do. So we need to get rid of lust because the flesh lusts. The flesh wants to do what it wants. But God says, no, when I save you, I give you a, a new uh, nature, if you will, because you're now sealed with the Holy Spirit inside of you. So now you become a new creature, he says. And now you, you have the new creature inside you, the Holy Spirit. And now you want to do what God wants you to do. And when you do sin in the flesh... The Holy Spirit inside you grieves you and makes you feel horrible. You're like, oh, man, did I do that? The Holy Spirit grieves us, the Bible says. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of promise, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. So when we're saved and we sin, we feel bad. That's one of the sure ways that we know that we're saved because the Holy Spirit inside of us goes, oh, did you just do that? <laughs> so it's best to serve instead of sin. The flesh wants to sin but God saved us not to sin, but to serve. So that turned out really good right there. That's not in my notes, amen. Sometimes God gives me some good stuff while I'm talking that I can put up here on the board for you. So we continue there in verse 5. And 5, 6, and 7 contain the seven things. And I'll write those up here after we read. And I want you to look at each one of those individually of what those are that are the seven things that Peter talks about here. Verse 5, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Okay, so salvation is by faith. So the first thing that we need is faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So, so we're saved by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the blood. So when we have faith, then we are supposed to add to the faith these seven things. So there's seven things that we, who are saved by faith, need after we're saved. And need to make sure that we keep and preserve and, and make sure we practice these seven things. What are they? Giving all diligence, add to your faith, well, number one, virtue. And to virtue, two, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, number four, patience. And to patience, number five, godliness. And to godliness, number six, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, number seven, charity. So there are seven things that we that are Christians should have that we practice. And one of the ways you can tell if a person is a good Christian who is walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh is whether or not they have these seven things. It's almost like the fruits of the Spirit, only this is a little different. This is, I guess you could say, this is Peter's version. <laughs> but uh, we, we'll probably look at the fruits of the Spirit too. Uh, I have a video on the fruits of the Spirit. Look at that. You can tell if a person is walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh by whether or not they have the fruits of the Spirit and whether or not they have these seven things. And, and the warning is, if you don't have these seven things, you're going to fall. And you're going to be one of these Christians who's in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out of the will of God. I want to be always in and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not go sin on Saturday and then go to church on Sunday. I don't want to be that type of person. I want to always be serving the Lord. Amen? So it says here these seven things. Verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice that. If they abound. So you're not only supposed to practice these and have these in you, you're supposed to abound in these. That, that means you're supposed to go out of your way to make sure that these are in you and come out of you. Okay? And it says here as well in verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Now it doesn't say he's lost his salvation. Some people go here and say, See, you lost your salvation. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you, Hey, buddy, you forgot the reason God saved you. He saved you to serve Him and to be a blessing to others. He didn't save you so you could go sin and just live for yourself. Okay? So He's saying, hey, don't, don't forget that. Because when we're saved, we're purged from our sins through the blood of Christ. That's past, present, and future sins. Can't lose your salvation. But now look at verse um, 10. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, Give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now people say, well, see, make your calling and election sure, that's salvation. And they try to make this a salvation issue. Okay, if this is a salvation issue, then your salvation depends on whether or not you have these seven things. 
Now you just got a works gospel. That doesn't make sense. So you're calling in the ministry. Sounds like he's writing to ministers as well as other Christians in your election, sure. Now, I don't see this as losing your salvation. I see this as, hey, make sure you walk in the Spirit to get the rewards that God offers in heaven. You see, there are rewards that we can get for our service at the judgment seat of Christ. And so if you do right, you'll get rewards. If you sin and you fall into sin as a Christian and you're a poor, 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 poor testimony of what a Christian is supposed to be, then wouldn't it be horrible to get to heaven and not have any rewards? Not to have anything to show that you love Jesus and you served him? That would be really sad. Really sad. So then I can't stop in verse 10 because there's a colon. So we've got to continue to verse 11, which ends in a period. So look what it says. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Now see, people again go, see, this is how you enter into the kingdom. and you're not. So they try to apply this as salvation by works. I can see why they do that. But remember who Peter is writing to. He's thinking any minute the rapture could come, so he's thinking I'm writing um, to people that will probably go through the tribulation soon. Well, in the tribulation, you can lose it. But today, Paul tells us you can't. So remember also the double application of the book of First and Second Peter. When you get to Paul, all of Paul's writings apply to the church age. What comes after that? Well, Hebrews, then James. James, we've looked at, is has to be early church before Paul and tribulation to the Jews scattered abroad. First Peter, we can apply a lot of it to the church, but also we can see it does have a double application. It does have some application to the tribulation. And here's a great passage. If you're a tribulation person and the rapture's already come and you're reading this, you go, wow, well, I sure want to get into the kingdom because the kingdom is what's coming next. So you look at that and you go, oh, well, okay. So you kind of see that double application. Now, let's start here by me writing up here the seven things that we just read. And I want to go through each one of those. And I want to make this as personal as I can. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes when a preacher makes it personal, people say, oh, no, now he's gone to meddling. <laughs> You know, a lot of people love to hear preaching of the Bible as long as it's about what the Bible says about end times or, or other things. But when you say, now the Bible says this about you, they go, oh no, shut up, I don't want to hear about my sin. <laughs> well, we got to make it personal, okay? Do you have these seven things? The first thing mentioned is virtue, all right? I'm going to go through each one of these for you and define them because some of them we know what they are and we use the terms today. But I hate to say it, some of the terms used in the Bible are not used in our everyday language nowadays. We used to be a Bible society in which we used Bible words. But sadly, our country and our world has turned against God in the Bible. And so a lot of the words in the Bible, people have forgotten. So it's important that we define them. And the best way I've found to define is the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, a great dictionary by Noah Webster, who actually used the King James Bible and, and defined words and then even gave Bible verses where the word is used. I just find that great. New dictionaries oftentimes change the meanings of words. And no, no, we need to make sure that we have the definition that, that, that the translators wanted, that the uh, early American English wanted, but also what the word actually means in the King James Bible. And the best way to define it was Webster's 1828. So we have seven things here mentioned that Peter says, if you do these things, you'll be fruitful and you won't fall into sin. So practice these seven things. What are they? Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly love, and charity. And, you know, I think it was in 1 Peter, but we'll, we'll check a little later, that he said that above all, the most important is number seven. Above all these. Both Peter and Paul said above all things, charity. So charity should probably be number one. But he puts it here as number seven, but he tells us in another place that the most important of all is charity. So what are these things and what do they mean? Let me give you the definitions of these. First of all, virtue. Virtue means moral goodness, abstaining from vice. 
So a Christian is supposed to, after they get saved, look at sin as wicked, evil, vile, nasty, and to do everything that they possibly can to stay away from sin. Or as Paul says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So part of being a Christian is hating sin. Um, I probably don't preach enough against sin. I'll be honest. I wish I did. But I'm trying to give you as much Bible as I can. And my thought is the Lord will convict you through the Scriptures. In my sermons, I try to give as many verses as I can because I don't want to just stand up here and give you my words. I want to give you God's words. So I want to preach against sin. I hate sin. I despise sin. But I feel like if I just give you what the Bible says, then the Lord will convict your heart of your sin. So the more scripture I give, that's what the Bible teaches, that the Bible itself is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it dividing asunder. You know, It's the Word of God that needs to get into your heart, and the Bible says that the Word of God can work in you. So the more verses that I give, the more I pray and ask God that that will help you to be against sin and make you want to serve God. So it says here, virtue is moral goodness and it's abstaining from something. It's saying, you know what? I want to know what is right and what is wrong, and I want to do right. Nowadays, they've redefined right and wrong, and it's kind of sad. <laughs> Nowadays, what was once wrong, they claim is okay. And what was once okay, the world is saying, well, no, 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 that's bad. It's a complete reversal. Why? Well, the answer is simple. The devil is taking over the world slowly, and the Bible says that he'll get it for seven years in the tribulation kingdom. And so the devil is trying to get rid of goodness in order to bring in evil. The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And in the days we live, we are seeing that. We're seeing them trying to change society and overthrow the morals of of the Bible. Um, many colleges, what they'll do in a college is they'll go, oh, those Victorians in the 1800 were so stupid and ridiculous with their Victorian morals. And they make fun of the moral fiber of the people in the 1800s. Now, why were they like that? Because the King James Bible had saturated the world and society became a moral society because society was a people full of, of Bible readers. England took that language of English all over the world. This I never said on the English Empire. And they took with them the King James Bible. And so society as a whole became a moral society. Now what are morals? Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. Don't commit adultery. Don't fornicate. Don't do things that are bad that the Bible says we shouldn't do. Those are morals. And it's to abstain from certain things. I like the word abstain. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5.22. Abstain. First Timothy 5.22. What does he say here? He says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. So what is it that God wants from us? He wants purity. He wants us to live a pure, holy life. Purity. You ever heard that word purity before? Um, I think it's interesting. Holiness, I guess, would be a good way to explain it. Holy. But I remember when I was a kid, in many churches, they would come to the young people and they'd, and they'd say, hey, how about being pure? And it was a wonderful moral thing to be a pure uh, um, child and to wait until you were married to engage in sexual relations. I remember they used to have in church a ring and they put this on and it's your purity ring. And what you're doing is you're swearing before God that you will not commit fornication and that you will wait until you're married to engage in sex because you wanted to be pure when you were married. Now people laugh at that. People think that's crazy. But that's part of being a moral person. Hating sin, not wanting to go partake in sin with others, and wanting to be pure and holy. Sanctified, set apart. That's the important. Now, over here let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. So abstaining from sinful lust. 1 Peter 2.11 says... Dearly beloved, as I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. So, lust is immoral. To lust after someone or something is an immoral thing. And yet we live in a world in which pornography is rampant. We live in a world where they sell, you know, a lot of women buy those romance novels. 
just to tickle their ears and make them want to stir them up to, you know, to lust after men. We live in a world where there's no shame. And they're out there preaching and teaching free love, man. Oh, it's not sin to have sex before marriage. Oh, you don't have to get married. to Move in together. Live together. Things like that. And that is immoral. And there are a lot of things in this world that are immoral. But a virtuous person is someone who has made up their mind, I am not going to fall into sin. I'm going to keep away from fornication and the lust of the flesh. I'm going to live a pure life. I'm going to be a pure, godly Christian person. So that's virtue. Now, what is knowledge? Knowledge is perception of truth in learning. Now, these are all definitions from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. So, knowing is more than just putting facts in your head. A lot of people today will go to a, a school, a university, or a college, and they'll spend four or five or six years getting a whole bunch of stuff in their head. But a lot of what they're taught is not true. A lot of it is actually indoctrination rather than education. Propagation rather than edification. And it's sad. It's sad to see that. So they're learning things, but like the Bible says, they're ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's sad. That's, that's especially sad. But uh, according to the dictionary, knowledge is being able to use what you know to perceive truth. So knowledge is not just knowing something. It's knowing what's true and what's not. And it's learning and sadly, in the world we live today, we live in a world full of lies. We have internet. We have these cell phones that you can find anything you want on the internet. Look up any, any, anything you want. A lot of times it's not even true. You can know a whole lot and yet not even know the truth. It's kind of sad. So knowledge, well, what do you think he's talking about? Well, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The Bible says that this book is truth. So true knowledge is knowing the Bible. You may know a whole lot about other things, but if you don't know the Bible, you really don't know anything. You don't have knowledge and perception of truth. Because the more you read the Bible, the more you go, wow, that book's right. It's historical fact of the past, and it's prophecy of historically things that will happen in the future. No other book is like the Bible that tells the past, present, and future. It tells us right from wrong. Temperance. Now, here's a word a lot of people today don't use, temperance. When I see temperance, I see temper, and I think, oh, you got a temper, it's angriness. And, 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 and I always thought temperance meant getting angry. <laughs> but that's not what temperance is. And so sometimes I think, what does temperance mean? And I, I remember history, what was it, in the 1920s or something, the temperance movement in America. Uh, Billy Sunday was a famous evangelist that would go and preach against wine and liquor and getting drunk. And he helped to start what's called the temperance movement. What is temperance? Well, have to look it up, 1828 Dictionary. Temperance means moderation, restraint, calmness, being calm, not getting angry and flying off the handle and getting a temper. It's like not having a temper is temperance. <laughs> it's really, if you want to think about what does temperance mean, it means don't have a temper, don't get angry. Be Learn how to restrain yourself from, from well, the best way I can say is it's self-control. I know that's not in the dictionary, but to me, temperance is knowing how to control yourself and not flying off the handle and getting upset and getting angry and screaming and hollering and, oh, dare I say it, running around in the middle of the street at night and burning down buildings and such as that as you break the windows and, and uh, you know, burn down cop cars and things like that. That's not temperance. <laughs> that's writing. That's, that's wickedness. That's immoral because that's engaging in evil rather than good. And that's what this is. This is over here we have evil, sin. The opposite of that is not being evil, being moral, being good, restraining your yourself from giving in to the baser um, the desires of the flesh. Uh, let's go to Philippians 4 5. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 says this: Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. That's the Apostle Paul. And he's talking about temperance. Temperance is moderation. He's saying, let everybody know that you're not an angry person that flies off the handle and can't control yourself. Let people know that you can control yourself, that you're a dependable person that can be relied on and counted on, and not someone that others don't want to be around because you scare them. Have you ever met someone like that that does whatever they want whenever they want? 
and you say something they don't like and they just start cussing you out, screaming at you, and you're like, oh, I didn't. It, it, that's a person with no temperance, no self-control. That's an immoral person. And our society used to, back in the 1800s and early 1900s, our parents taught this. Because they were taught this in church, and they read this in the Bible, that as, as a human being, I'm supposed to respect other human beings. And there's a certain way that I should uh, deal with other people in society. And I'm supposed to be calm and in control of myself and, and respectful of others. That's temperance. Uh, look at Galatians 5.23. And it's sad to me that we're seeing a world in which there, there's no more of that. Our society has changed. And it's changing into an immoral, evil, non-virtuous uh, society with no, with no temperance whatsoever, with no self-control. Let's look at uh, Galatians 5 and verse 23. Fruits of the Spirit. Well, we're, I told you we'd come here, so let's read verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, verse 23, temperance. Temperance. So we've got the nine fruits of the Spirit, and the last one is temperance. Against there, such there is no law. Are you a temperate person? Can you control yourself? Do you have any restraint and self-control? Sadly, there's people in the world today claim to be Christians. They don't. And... Uh, Probably the hardest thing in this world to control is this right here, your tongue. And one of the ways you can tell if a person has any restraint or any self-control or is an, a temperate person or not is, is what they use their tongue for. If all they're doing is going around talking bad and saying bad things about other people, then that's not a person that has any self-control. And yet you see that a lot. People go around talking bad about others, not, not, un, not able to control themselves. The next one, number four, is patience. Patience, according to the 1828 dictionary, is suffering of afflictions. Endurance, calm temper, which bears evil without murmuring or discontent. Perseverance. So patience is more than just putting up with something. It's putting up with it with temperance and knowledge and say, okay, I don't like that, but I'm going to suffer it, I'm going to put up with it, and I'm not going to go talk bad about those people that are doing it, and I'm going to do my best to persevere and put up with what they're doing, but not be like them myself. Does that make sense? Let's look at some verses. 1 Timothy 5, 14. And I always like to show you what Paul says, because oftentimes Paul and Peter are on the same page, <laughs> and they need to be. Uh, first. Timothy 5.14 I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give an occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Paul says now, God made men and God made women. And women need to get married and guide their house and be godly and, and, and love their husbands, love their children, and not go talk bad about other people. Because that is following the flesh, and, and even giving in to the devil, going around talking bad about people. But what do you see today? Well, I don't watch TV a lot, but from my understanding, there's all sorts of, what do they call them, um, shows, reality shows. A lot of times it's all about women, you know, the, the, the rich women of Atlanta or something like that, where all these women get together and drink wine and talk bad about their husbands. It's like, dude, do you read the Bible? <laughs> I mean, hey, ladies, that's not very patient. That, that's not the kind of a lady that God wants. Matter of fact, that's what the devil wants. And you're giving occasion to the devil when you speak bad about other people. And you ought to stop it. Especially if you claim to be a Christian. 2 Timothy 2.24. Hello. <laughs> Boy, I've really gone to meddling now. Amen. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Oh, okay, so I'm supposed to serve. I'm not supposed to strive. What is strive? Uh, causing strife and contentions and arguments with others. The servant of the Lord, uh, 2 Timothy 2.24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness. That is hard. It's very hard to be patient, especially with evil. In the day and age in which we live, I don't like seeing evil. And I'm finding that I'm not as patient as I should be. But there is a thing called righteous indignation, and it's not wrong to speak up and speak out against sin. Okay, 
Be patient with people. Be patient with things. But when the time comes, say the Bible says this and such and such is wrong. And we should speak up against evil. Just We should do it in a patient, temperate, uh, virtuous way. Not in the flesh attacking and lashing out, but with self-control saying, Hey, you guys are doing this. Did you know the Bible says this? Do you know that what you're doing is sin and that you're serving the devil? Do you realize that that's immoral, living in that sort of lifestyle and doing those things you're doing? That's the best way to talk to people because you're not coming across as, Hey, I hate you and I'm mean and I'm angry at you. It's, can I just level with you? Can I just reason with you? That is bad. And if they accept it, great. But a lot of times they don't. The more people sin, the less they want to hear that they're sinning. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 4, I believe, if I'm reading this correctly. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, the Bible says this. But in all things approving yourselves as the ministers of God. Okay, verse 3. Go back to verse 3. Giving none offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. So here Paul is talking about being a minister. Well, I'm an ordained minister, so this is for me. Verse 4. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. So one of the things that we that are preachers should be is patient. And I feel that I've been very, very patient with many people. Um... There may be a time where I need to come out and mention names and talk about people and say, now this person is openly living in sin and this person is teaching falls out. And if I need to do that, maybe I will. I've always said the best thing to do is not deal with a man because oftentimes that just start, starts an argument and he'll start attacking you and you start attacking back. And I'm not interested in getting in what some people call, and I'm sorry if this is a little caustic to you, but I'm not interested, my dad said this, so I'm going to say it, it might not sound very Christian to say, but it's, you know, it's the best way I know to explain it. I'm not interested in getting in a pissing contest with other Christians, okay? I'm sorry if that offended you if I said that, but that's not me. I don't want to walk around with a chip on my shoulder and put down other people and call them names and talk bad about them and tell them how much better I am than them. That's not my ministry. Matter of fact, that is not ministry. That is attacking. So what God has showed me from the Bible is to be patient and to not talk about other people to the best of my ability unless there comes up an issue of doctrine. And for me, the best thing to do is not get on YouTube and go, well, this guy named so-and-so on YouTube is preaching such and such, and that moron, that fool, that jackass, that liar. No, I'm not going to come across as that. I would bet, rather come to you like this. Well, I heard the other day there's a guy on YouTube who's preaching this, that, or the other thing. Now, who he is isn't important, but he's bringing this up. Let's take what he's saying and then see if it lines up with the Scriptures. Now I'm dealing with the issue, with the controversy. I'm not dealing with the man. And I've always been the kind of person... And I had to learn this on my own, and I learned this from my dad, because I wasn't taught this in Bible school. My Bible school teacher was a very caustic person who name-called and, and put people down and, and loved to get in a fight with people. I don't want to be that way. I, I learned from the Bible that's not how we're supposed to be. So I have always said, deal with the issue, not with the man. But a lot of so-called Christians and ministers, they'll deal with the man and not with the issue. And I, I've just never understood that unless they're in the flesh and not in the spirit. So I want to walk in the spirit that I fulfill not the lust of the flesh. To me, if you claim to be a preacher and a teacher and you're on YouTube or whatever and you're preaching what you that's your ministry. You go do your ministry, I'll do my ministry and when we get to heaven we'll let God sort it out and see who gets the rewards, okay? But if you're going around and you're and you're preaching a false doctrine, I'm going to deal with the doctrine not with you. Because I, I don't know you and, and who knows maybe you'll get right later if I show you from the scriptures that you're wrong. So I want to always go back to this book and keep looking at it instead of looking at some man and making a fight between me and him. No, let's just keep going to the scriptures, okay? Does that make sense to you? And that's what a person who is patient will do. There are some people out there that are so impatient that they can't wait to attack. And there are some people, believe it or not, there are some people out there that can't wait for my new sermon to come out or my new teaching to come out on YouTube every week so they can take it and go make a video against it. It's incredible. Those people have no temperance, no self-control, no patience. And that's sad. And you mark it down, they're not very virtuous. They're not very moral. 
They're not abstaining from vice. They're running swift. What does the Bible say? Feet swift to run to mischief. That's what they, they are. They, they love to do mischief. And that's someone you mark her down in the flesh and not in the spirit. So the next one is godliness. What is godliness? A religious life, careful observance of God's laws. Obedience through love and reverence. Ooh, i got a lot of verses on this. Let's go to Titus 2, 4, 12. So wanting to not only just say I'm a Christian and run around and tell people I'm a Christian, but wanting to act like a Christian. And, and being able to say, hey, this verse says this, so I'm going to do this, what this verse says. And, and I want to be this kind of person, because this verse says it. And it's not just knowing the Bible, the knowledge. It's putting into practice what the Bible says. That's someone who's godly. They're trying to follow God on a daily basis by living holy and living a pure, righteous life. So, Titus 2.12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world. How should we as Christians live? Well, we should live righteously and godly. And guess what? We should deny worldly lusts and ungodliness. We shouldn't run with the world to do sin. We should go against the world and say, no, I'm going to be over here with Jesus. You go do your thing, but I want you to know you're on the wrong side. You need to come over here. And it's sad that many Christians aren't like that. Many Christians are ungodly. They don't obey the Bible. And that's sad. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, if you're going to make up your mind to be godly, to be a true Bible believer, and follow the Bible, and do what it says, you'll find very, very quickly there's going to be people attacking you. And it's going to be these people. Lost people will attack you for your stand for the Bible. But sadly, other people that claim to be Christians will attack you. And that's this crowd. That's the lustful, sinful, uh, fleshly, carnal crowd rather than those that are spirit-filled and serving the Lord. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. But thou, O men of God, flee these things. Flee what things? Well, he's talking about evil things. Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Well, there's patience mentioned. There's godliness mentioned. Um, the, so a lot of these things that Peter is mentioning are things that Paul already said in some of his epistles that came out way before. Shows me that, oh, Peter must have read Paul's epistles and got some of that from Paul. So that's godliness. Now let's go to the next one. Here's a hard one for many to take. What does it say? Brotherly kindness. Now I put up here brotherly love. Uh, I wrote it wrong. It's actually brotherly kindness. So let me change that real quick. It's really the same thing, but you can love someone and not be kind to them. <laughs> so <laughs> kindness is more than just love. A lot of people think love is just a, an emotion. It's not. Love is an action. But to a lot of people, when you say love, they say, well, I have love now, but I, I don't love you anymore. They, they think it's just an emotion. True love is an action, and it's doing something, proving your love by serving so the Bible says that we are supposed to practice brotherly kindness. What does that mean? Kindness in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary is goodwill, benevolence, hospitality, and charity. It's being good to someone, going out of your way to be hospitable, to be, dare I say it, nice. Now, I don't like the term nice. If you ever, there's an old poem. One of my favorite poems is a poem about the English are so nice. If you get a chance, look that up on Google or something. And uh, the word nice, really, if you go back to, the, to where the word came from, nice really means dumb. <laughs> so when you're saying so-and-so is nice, what we mean in our head is they're so kind. But because we changed the word nice to mean kind, but really nice means dumb. <laughs> or, or, well, not dumb, but not, I don't know. Uh, it, it's just, look up the word nice and then find out where it came from. I, I kind of don't like to use the word nice. But kind. Are you a kind person? Okay, let's make this personal. Are you kind? Some of you people out there on YouTube that attack Robert Breaker, are, is this you? <laughs> Or have you shown everybody on YouTube who you really are? You're one of these people. Because you're not kind. You're not temperate. You're not meek and, and caring and loving. You, you have no charity. Okay, we know who you are. If you're saved, big if in some cases, but if you're saved, then you're one of these. You're a carnal Christian. And you're going to fall. 
Because what did he say? He said, if you do these things, you won't fall. So if you do these, the opposite, then you're going to fall. How great will be your fall is the only question. Are you kind? Let's look at some verses, Ephesians 4.32. I want to be the type of Christian that the Bible says, so I want to be kind. And that is hard sometimes. It is hard to be kind to people, especially when they aren't kind back. Okay? Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is not opinion. This is not Paul saying, what I'd really like you to do, maybe, perhaps, if you feel like it, is be nice to each other and be kind. No, this is a command from God. The Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul, and this is a command for the church today. And this is how we as Christians are to treat one another. Be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. Now, one thing that I learned from my father was that. And that was hard for me. I remember after I got saved, I'm telling on myself right now, maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to. I just thought of this the other day, and I felt so bad about it. I had recently gotten saved, and we went down to the courthouse to get, I don't even remember what we were there for. Maybe it was to change papers or something for my car. And my dad said, well, I have two or three things to do. So we had to change a tag. We had to do something else. And I was only 18, 19 years old, just recently saved. And we're standing in line for like 30 minutes, and we finally get up to this counter, and here's this woman there at the counter. And she was angry, she was mean, she was hateful to my father. And I don't know why, maybe she was just having a bad day, I don't know, but she was not a very nice lady. And my dad comes up, and my dad was the most kind person that I've ever met in my life. Now, if you were evil and you were wrong, you wouldn't want to talk to my dad because he was stern and he would tell you the truth. You are a sinner. You are doing wrong. You're going to split hell right open. I mean, he would talk to you in a stern manner, but he was kind. It wasn't him in anger saying that. He was saying that out of concern. And many people who knew my dad saw that. They saw him as a kind person who cared about them. But he wouldn't back down and he wouldn't lie to them. He would tell them the truth even though he knew they didn't want to hear it. So I remember this. And we're there in front of this woman. And I'm standing next to my dad. And this woman was having a bad day. And my dad says, okay, I have three things to do. And your sign there says only three things at a time. My dad says, let's take care of this one first, then we'll do this one, and then we'll do this one. Now, dad had been there many times. He's done this stuff before. He says, now, here's what I want. I want, are you listening? And he said that to the lady because she was like looking around, having a bad day. You could tell something was bothering her. And, and my dad says, is everything all right, ma'am? And she goes, it's fine, it's fine. And my dad says, okay, let's take care of this. Okay, this is what I needed you to do. And, and so she did that, and she did it wrong. And she gave it back, and my dad said, okay, ma'am, here's the problem. You did this here, and you put this wrong. I don't know if it was address was wrong or a name or something. Now, could you change that? She's like, oh, and she, you could just tell this woman was just, there's something wrong with her. Well, they got that taken care of. And, they, and we're there for like 30 minutes. And this woman does it. She does it wrong. And she has to do it right again. And we get to the last thing. And it's one of those things, you know, you ever go to get something done and you think it's going to be done like that and it takes an hour or two uh, because of some reason or another. It was one of those things where you had to call the supervisor. And the supervisor came and I don't know what to do. Well, let me go. And he go call somebody else. And they're trying to figure out how to fix this. The whole time this lady's getting upset and getting angry. And my dad, I think back on how sweet and kind my father was to that lady. But I was only 18, 19. I wasn't a mature Christian. I wasn't very patient and godly at that time. I'll be honest with you because I just recently got saved. A lot of this comes through experience and Bible reading. And this woman, she got upset with my dad. And she started crying. And she said, what did you do? And she yelled at my father. And I'm looking at this, and I've been watching the whole time, and I'm like, my dad didn't do anything to this woman. She's had a haughty spirit and been angry the whole time. And I said, woman, what's wrong with you? You, and I called her the B word. And I'm sorry I did. I was wrong. I shouldn't have. But, And I said, you are just acting like an utter beep. And I said it. And my dad says, son, go sit over there right now. He said, that's not how you talk to a woman. I mean, I thought I was helping my dad, and here I get the rebuke for rebuking an evil woman. I, I, but I realized my dad was a patient, kind person. And he wasn't going to take that because that wasn't kind. He had been trying to be kind the whole time. He said, ma'am, I apologize for my son. That was not right. He said, ma'am, you and I together, we can fix this. What can I do to help you? 
And that woman said, I'm sorry I've been so mean to you. And, and it just the kindness of my father that day showed me that the way to resolve a situation is not get angry back and name call and attack. The best thing is to be kind, even if it hurts. <laughs> and I've always watched my father, just how kind he was through his life. And I just said, Lord, help me be half the man that my dad was. Because I look back and I remember him fondly as a patient, temperate, kind person with charity. Oftentimes when I couldn't muster it, he did. He was a true Christian, and I appreciate him. What a blessing he was. So that's what we're supposed to be. Let's go to Colossians 3.12. Kind. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. My dad not only read his Bible, my dad believed his Bible, and my dad practiced what the Bible said. And I saw a godly Christian man in my father putting up with stuff like that. Wow, he was a merciful, kind person. Yes, he was stern. You didn't want to make him, you know, upset. Uh, because, well, he, he didn't really get upset, but he also never backed down. So if you were in the wrong, he, he would say, look, son, what'd you do wrong? I mean, he, but he never lashed out in anger. I just think back on him as having bowels of mercies and being kind and humble and meek and long-suffering. And I just want that testimony when I die, that people remember me the same way. Wish that could be on my tombstone, amen? He was kind. <laughs> Boy, who could ask for more, amen, to be the type of Christian that God said to be? Brotherly kindness. Romans 12, I shouldn't have told that story, now everybody thinks I'm a horrible person. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that was when I was young. I was way younger. I've, I've matured since then, okay? Calling a woman that, I'm horrible. Anyway, thank you Jesus for forgiveness, amen? Well anyway, Rome, and I did apologize before we left. I went up and said, ma'am, I'm sorry I said that. I remember that now. But anyway, Romans 12.10 said, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Kindly affection. So we're supposed to have affection toward other Christians. We don't have to like them, but we're supposed to treat them with respect, dignity, kindness, and love. Now how about it? You claim to be a Christian? You want to tell me that you're a Bible-believing Christian? And you don't have any one of these? What's wrong with you? You've got problems. You need to get right with God. The last one is charity. Now, charity means love, benevolence, goodwill, that disposition, okay, I'm quoting from the 1828 dictionary, I love what it says here, that disposition of the heart which inclines men to think favorably of their fellow man and to do them good. <laughs> what an interesting de definition of charity. You know, I think of charity, a lot of new versions of the Bible, they change charity to love. That, no, that's not right. When you think of love, a lot of people today just think of an emotion. Oh, I love you. I love you. But charity has to do more with sacrificial. It's, it's, it's a sacrificial giving. It's also it's long-suffering. It's also putting up with somebody that you care about. That's hard. That's hard to do. But it's also, as he says here, an in, a disposition of your heart which inclines you to think favorably of your fellow men and to do them good. Whew. Charity. It's not easy to practice charity. There's a lot of my fellow men that I look at and I go, oh, that's an evil person, man. They, they're, they're horrible. But I'm not supposed to think of them like that. I'm supposed to think of them as that person has potential to be what God wants them to be. So how can I be kind to them and help them to reach the potential of being in God's will rather than being bing, 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 like a ping pong ball back and forth or a, or a pinball. <laughs> anyway, so do you have any of these? Do you have virtue? Do you have knowledge? Do you have temperance? Do you have patience? Do you have godliness? Do you have brotherly kindness? Do you have charity? Now, I could go through and show you the verses on charity. I, I guess I haven't written them down here, but we've looked at them before. Both Peter and Paul speak about charity. Let me, if I remember right, it's in Colossians. And uh, Colossians chapter 3, I believe it is. Yeah, Colossians 3, okay? So here is Peter telling us to have charity in 2 Peter chapter 1. And in uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul says, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So, all this boils down to is a heart thing. Well, I hate to, I hate to draw a heart up here. <laughs> so corny, but I'll do that. Uh, I'll put a heart right here. And it's a heart thing. Out of your heart is supposed to come this charity. Out of your heart is supposed to come this kindness. Out of your heart is supposed to come this patience. Out of your heart is supposed to come uh, godliness and these other things. It's a heart matter. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay? A lot of times you can tell what someone's heart is like by how they speak. If all they do is run around and cuss people out, you know that's a dirty individual because they're using dirty words and it's because they have a dirty heart. Okay? But the Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. God in heaven is looking down and he's looking at your heart. And he wants to know what's in your heart. And if you are this kind of a person that is trying to keep these seven things and practicing them in your heart, then you're going to be the type of person who's walking in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, and who's doing what they're supposed to do as a Christian. So go back to 2 Peter and uh, let's go here. 2 Peter. So this is, these are the seven things. Verse 8, And if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you do these things, you will produce fruit as a Christian. Now, that might just be fruit of righteousness. You're going around and doing good things. You're doing good deeds. But a lot of times when I see the word fruit in the Bible, I always think about winning souls. Do you realize it's a lot easier to win somebody to the Lord when you're acting the way a Christian is supposed to act than if you were in the flesh? How many people do you know that are carnal Christians that are winning people to Jesus? <laughs> Very few. Because <laughs> the world looks at them and they think, well, they must be one of us. They're doing the same sins we are. It's like, uh, no. But when they see you trying to live right, trying to do right, trying to practice kindness, they say, hey, you're different. Why do you act that way? Oh, because the Bible tells me I'm a Christian. Wow. Well, you know, you... you there's something different about you. Why don't you tell me about it? Well, isn't that great to be able to share the gospel with people? Because they see that you're different. So Christianity is more than just what you believe in your head. Okay? A lot of people, and I'm, this is really bad, but this is your head. Out of the head, we believe knowledge. But you know, we aren't just saved just because we know something in the head. That knowledge has to be in your head heart. So you need to know something and believe, and, and Bible tells us that belief comes from the heart. This is where you believe. There's some people that believe in their head something, but that doesn't mean they're saved. Just knowing these things isn't practicing these things. Not enough to just know the gospel. You're supposed to believe the gospel from your heart. So Christianity is more than what you just believe in your head. Which, by the way, is good. There's doctrine we're supposed to have. We're supposed to know. We're supposed to memorize and meditate and, and put in our head the Bible. Know the Bible. But Christianity is more than just head knowledge. It's practicing something from your heart. And that's what the Bible says. Now, Proverbs chapter 9, and verse 1. Um, I told you ooh, a couple months ago that there was a famous evangelist coming to Pensacola to preach. And that my wife and I, we went and heard him every night that he was preaching over in Pensacola. And I, I even made a couple videos about him and his books. Uh, he has some great books. His man's name is William Grady. And uh, William Grady is a great preacher and teacher. He's very long. I thought I was long. A lot of my sermons are an hour long. He could go almost two hours in a sermon. He's a very long-winded man. But I've heard him preach this message twice now. Uh, that time when I went a couple of months ago, and then way before that in Bible school, he preached on the seven pillars of wisdom. And he took us to this passage. And uh, this William Grady, also known as Bill Grady, he preached on Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 1. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. And uh, he talked about how there's seven pillars of a house. And he talked about how 
in the old days, they would, they would build a house sometimes by just putting up these pillars. And they would put them up like this. Got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pillars. And so this right here would be your door or the entrance. And then they would, you know, wrap cloth or something around it to cover it. And this was the basic, easiest way in the old times to build a house, put up seven pillars and have a door. And I don't know, I guess in the back here, you would have a place to sleep here or here. And here would kind of be your little living room area or something like that. And so he, in his sermon, talked about the seven pillars of wisdom and how it's like a house. And in his sermon, and I don't want to preach his sermon for him, I'll let him do that, but he talked about, you're like a house. You know, the Bible tells us that, that we're a temple or a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. So we're like a house. So if we're in our house and we have these seven pillars, we have only way to look, one way to look, and that's out. So from our heart, if we practice these, then they will go out to others. But a lot of people, well, they... They're blind. Why are they blind? I guess they close the door. And they don't want to work that out. They don't, I don't know. You have to see his sermon to see more about it. He went pretty in detail to that. But look what it says here in verse 8. Okay? He gives us these seven things. And then in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your, your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Well, I don't want to be unfruitful. I don't want to be barren. You know, when I think of the word barren, well, I think of a, a woman having a baby. And a barren woman is a woman who's never able to have kids. She's unable to have a child. Well, when you win somebody to the Lord, that's your fruit for the Lord. That's that's someone you that's like a son or a daughter that you led to the Lord. They're your son in the Lord. But I also don't ever want to fall into sin. So the Bible teaches me that the best way to live is to live for Jesus by paying careful attention to these seven things and making sure that I do what they say. Now, I was going to go and get into the gospel. Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Maybe next time as we get started, I'll uh, back up a little bit in these verses and give the gospel and everything like that and talk more about that. And uh, so much to give, so little time. But uh, he says blind. There are a lot of Christians out there that are blind spiritually. And I'll get into that more next time. So there it is. Do you have these seven things? Are you in the will of God? All right, God bless you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.